Chapter Twenty Three of Molly's Prince. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Riley. Molly's Prince by Rosa Nuche Carey. Chapter Twenty Three Across the Gulf Links. Learn to live and live to learn. Ignorance like a fire burns. Little tasks make large returns. Bayard Taylor Sits the wind in that quarter. Shakespeare When Waveney went home the following Sunday, she carried with her a choice little piece of information which she retailed with much gusto at the tea-table. Father, she said in a mysterious voice, I have found out something so interesting about our dear little Monsieur Blackie. Then Molly, who was pouring out the tea, paused in her task to listen. He is a relation of the Mrs. Harfords, their cousin once removed. Miss Althea told me so. His father, Colonel Ingram, was their own cousin. Molly's face wore an awed expression. She was evidently much impressed, but Mr. Ward looked a little perplexed. Ingram, he muttered, I do not remember the name, and yet I thought I knew all their relations. No, father dear, returned Waveney gently. Miss Althea said you had never seen any of them. They were living abroad because Mrs. Ingram's health was so bad. There was only one daughter, Gwendolyn, and she is married now. But I thought you and Molly would be interested to know that he is a connection of the dear ladies at the Red House. Then Noel solemnly rapped on the table with his knife. I propose Monsieur Blackie's health, he said grandly. He seems a respectable sort of party, and I am proud to have made his acquaintance. I regret, I may say I deeply regret, that I once made the unlucky observation that his head was like a scrubbing brush, and that his mustache was of the Mephistophelian pattern. But what are such trifles between friends? And then his voice grew thin and nasal. For, I guess, and I do calculate, ladies and gentlemen, that the party in question is boss of the whole show, and will boom considerable. And then he sat down and glared at Molly through his pince nez, but Molly, who seemed a little flurried and excited, said nothing at all. Only, as she and Waveney were putting on their hats for church, she said, in rather a subdued, quiet little voice, Wave, dear, of course I am glad about Mr. Ingram, but it does not make any real difference, does it? For we always knew he was a gentleman. Father thinks he must be rich, he is so generous with his money. But he will never be too grand to be our friend, will he? Molly's voice was not quite steady when she said this. To her simplicity, it seemed a surprising thing that their homely, kindly Monsieur Blackie should have such grand relations. Molly spent a very happy day at the Red House. Althea, who knew what girls loved best, told Waveney to take her all over the house and show her everything, and left them alone together. She and Doreen had an engagement for the afternoon, but tea was served up as usual in the library. When Althea returned, she found them nestled together in the big easy chair by the fire, Looking like a couple of babes in the wood, she said to Doreen afterwards, and it was so pretty and effective a picture that she forbade them to move, and then she sat down and talked to them in so sweet and friendly a way that Molly's soft heart was soon won, and when Noel arrived, looking a little shy and awkward, after the fashion of boys, he found them all talking merrily together, both Althea and Doreen were charmed with Molly. Doreen frankly owned to her sister that she had never seen so beautiful a face. 
if it were not for her lameness she would be perfect she said regretfully and althea agreed to this it is a pity of course she returned gently but there is something pathetic in it and then her unconsciousness is so childlike she is a sweet creature and i love her already but not so much as i love my little undine for somehow both she and doreen often called her by this name Waveney had not seen her little friend Betty again, but Althea and Doreen were constantly at the house in High Street, and she often heard them mention her name. Sometimes of an evening, when she was reading to herself, she heard them talking about the Chaytors, and as they never dropped their voices, she thought it no harm to listen. Joa is a different woman, Doreen once said, I never saw such a change in any one. I always knew Tristram was her favorite. The world has to play second fiddle now. I am a little sorry for him sometimes. Your sorrow is wasted, Dory, returned her sister with a smile. Thorold is too big and strong for these petty feelings. He values Joa's peace of mind far too much to disturb it by paltry jealousy. He tells me that for the present... Tristram and the child will continue to live with them, until Tristram can earn enough to keep a respectable roof over his head. It was very lucky finding him that berth, and it really suits him very well. But Joa says that Betty misses her father terribly. She spends half her time at the window watching for him. Betty's name was perpetually on the sister's lips. Her queer little speeches, her odd ways, her shrewdness and intelligence, and above all her warm, childish heart were favorite topics, and Bet's last was a standing joke with them. Waveney began to wish to see her again, but Miss Althea never sent her now to the Chaytors. Once Joanna called and had tea at the Red House, but Betty was not with her. The child had a slight cold, she said, and she had left her with Jemima. But throughout the visit she talked of little else. Bet's lessons, her story books, the new doll that Althea had given her, and the bassinet that she was trimming for a Christmas present were all discussed quite seriously. Waveney listened eagerly in her corner. For once she found Miss Chater interesting. Her voice had lost its fretful strain, she spoke with animation, and as she talked, there was a pretty dimple that Waveney had never noticed. She must have been very pretty when she was a girl, thought Waveney. She is good-looking now, and her face is quite pleasant when she smiles. And then again she heard Bet's name and composed herself to listen. The love of that mite for her father is quite wonderful, went on Joanna. Even Thorold notices it. Quite an hour before Trist is due, Bet will be gluing her face and flattening her nose against the window, and nothing will move her. And all the time she is humming to herself, like a little bird, such funny little scraps of tunes. And then, when he crosses the road, she is out of the room like a dart. And to hear all her old-fashioned questions to him in the passage... Oh, it almost makes me cry to listen to her. Are you very tired, father dear? Have you had a hard day? Does your head ache? And are your feet cold? But Aunt Joa has made up such a big fire. Something like that every night. Bless her little heart, observed Doreen sympathetically, but Althea only smiled. And then she brings him in and makes such a fuss over him went on Joanna, just as though he were some feeble, gouty old gentleman. But Tristram lets her do it. I think he likes to feel her little fingers busy about him. She fetches him his warm slippers and a footstool, or a screen if the fire is hot, and when he is quite comfy, as she calls it, she climbs up on his knee and gives him an account of the day. When Joanna had taken her leave, Althea stood looking into the fire with a grave, abstracted look, but when Doreen returned to the room, 
she changed her attitude slightly. Joe seems very happy, does she not, Dory? She has not worn so bright a face since the old manor house days. No, indeed, and it is all Bet's influence. She is like a hen with one chick. It almost makes me laugh to hear her. I felt nearer crying, I assure you. But, Dory, is it not beautiful to see how love effaces self? And a little child shall lead them. Do you remember those words? Already Bet's tiny fingers have smoothed out the lines on Joa's face and taught her to smile again. Waveney only saw Mr. Chater on Thursday evenings at the porch house. The Shakespeare readings were still in full swing, and she still sat beside Nora Greenwell. She sometimes thought that Mr. Chater spoke less to her than to the other girls, though he was always careful to point out any fault of punctuation. Now and then, when she was a little weary of following the text, she would raise her eyes from the books, and more than once it had given her an odd shock to find, at that very moment, Mr. Chater was quietly regarding her. Then some sudden shyness made her eyelids droop again. Mr. Chater took no apparent notice of her. When the reading was over, he always joined Althea, and a grave bow, or perhaps a pleasant good night, when Waveney left the room, was all that passed between them. It was strange, then, that as Thorold Chater walked down the hill in the wintry darkness, a little pale face and a pair of dark, spiritual eyes should invariably haunt him. Never in his life had he seen such eyes, so soft and deep and magnetic. And then that babyish crop of brown, curly hair. He wondered why she wore it so. It made her look so childish, but he liked it, too. It struck him that she was lighter and more sprightly and full of grace and lissomeness than any girl he had seen, and that his name of Undine suited her down to the ground. He remembered well her sister's lovely face, but of the two he preferred his little Undine. Once, when he had entered the recreation hall, and the seat beside Nora Greenwell was vacant, a troubled look came into his eyes. But Waveney, who had only gone across to the house for a book Althea wanted, re-entered a moment later, and Thorold's brow cleared like magic as her light, springy step passed by his chair. "'I hope I have not disturbed you,' she said rather timidly, as he rose from his seat, and wished her good evening. But Miss Harford had forgotten her Shakespeare. Not at all, but we will begin now. Then, as Waveney opened her book, she wondered at Mr. Chater's grave, intent look. About ten days before Christmas, Waveney, attended by her little companions, Fuss and Fury, started off for a walk over the common. It was one of those ideal afternoons in December, when all young creatures feel it is a joy to be alive. There had been a heavy frost in the night, and the bright, wintry sunshine had not yet melted it. The frost king had touched the saplings with his white fingers, and even the bare blackberry bushes were transformed into things of beauty. The vast common seemed to glitter with whiteness under the pink glow of the winter sky. Waveney had turned her steps towards the golf links. The wind blew more bleakly there, but the wide stretch of open common, with the black windmill in the distance, always gave her a pleasant sensation of freedom. She loved to watch the sun sinking into his bed of bright-colored clouds, but when the pink glow faded, and the skyline became a cold, steely blue, she shivered a little as though she had stayed too long at some pageant, and set her face homewards. She had walked too far, and she knew the darkness would overtake her long before she reached the red house, and then Miss Althea would gently admonish her for her imprudence. 
the little dogs were tumbling over each other and wetting their silky coats in the frosty grass waveney called them sharply to order if no one were in sight she thought she would race them across the common but the next moment she heard footsteps behind her involuntarily she quickened her own steps it was rather a lonely part of the common there was no one to be seen only the gaunt black arms of the windmill seemed to stretch into the darkening sky the rapid even footsteps behind her made her nervous and gave her the feeling of being in a nightmare if she could only look around and then to her intense relief a familiar voice pronounced her name mr chater she gasped for her heart was beating so fast that she could hardly speak oh how glad i am it was very foolish of me but i never can bear to be followed in a lonely place i was afraid i frightened you he said coming to her side but you were walking so fast that i found it difficult to overtake you forgive me i know i have no right to lecture but at this hour the golf links is far too lonely a place for a young lady yes you are right returned waveney touched by this kind interest in her welfare and i must never walk here again so late but with a sigh of regret i do love it so do you returned mr chater quickly i wonder why but with his habitual reserve he forbore to add that it was his favorite walk it is so wide she replied in her earnest voice all this space with nothing between you and the sky makes one feel so free and happy the sunsets are always so beautiful here and if it were not for the loneliness i should love to watch the darkness like a big black ogre swallow up all the lovely light it was a pity waveney could not see mr chater's smile shall we stand and watch it now he said indulgently you have a safe escort so we need not fear your ogre only you must not take cold but waveney only thanked him and said that she was late already and that they had better go what a walk that was and how waveney remembered it afterwards if mr chater had laid himself out to please and interest her he could not have succeeded better books pictures accounts of his old summer wanderings and yet not for one moment did waveney feel that he was talking down to her level it seemed the spontaneous outpouring of a well-bred intellectual man glad to impart information to a congenial companion but if waveney was charmed and interested certainly mr chater was gratified miss ward's bright intelligence her racy and picturesque remarks her frankly confessed ignorance were all delightful to him since the old manor days he had seen so few girls and none of them had attracted him in the least there was something unique out of the common about miss ward he felt vaguely that he would like to know more of her perhaps it was this feeling that made him say presently i am afraid you have forgotten your little friend betty for he knew all about that meeting on the embankment betty had given him a most realistic and graphic account and the little lady did warm my hands so uncle theo and here bet rubbed away at his hands until she was red in the face and all the time she did talk and her great big eyes were laughing at me bet has a good memory for her friends and she often talks about you continued thorold she is a fascinating little person even to me though i do not profess to understand children she is full of surprises you never get to the end of her my sister fairly worships her yes i know returned waveney softly and i am so very glad glad for your sister i mean 
I should love to see Betty again. I am not like you, Mr. Chater. I have been a child worshipper all my life. Oh, I know they are naughty sometimes, but they are so much nearer the angels than we are, and they are not such a long way off from heaven. Heaven lies about us in our infancy. Are you a student of Wordsworth, Miss Ward? But she shook her head. I have read some of his poems, she returned modestly, but I am afraid I know very little good poetry. That is a pity, but one can always mend a fault. At Easter I propose having a course of reading from Tennyson and Mrs. Browning. Ah, here we are at the Red House. You will come in and have a cup of tea after your long walk, observed Waveney. Miss Doreen is in town, but I know Miss Althea is at home. Then, after a moment's hesitation, Mr. Chater assented and followed her into the house. "'My dear child, how late you are!' observed Althea, rather anxiously, as Waveney opened the library door. "'I was getting nervous about you.' "'I am afraid I am rather late,' confessed the girl. "'But fortunately, I met Mr. Chater, and he has come in with me for some tea.' Then there was no lack of welcome in Althea's face and voice. Fresh tea was ordered, and another supply of hot buttered scones, a big pine log thrown on the fire, and as Thorold sat in his luxurious chair, with a glass screen between him and the blaze, with his little walking companion opposite him, and Althea's warm smile on them both, he had never felt himself more comfortable or at his ease. End of chapter 23。Chapter 24 of Molly's Prince。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Riley. Molly's Prince by Rosa Nouche Carey. Chapter 24 Lost, Stolen, or Strayed. Rainy and rough sets the day. There's a heart beating for somebody. I must be up and away. Somebody's anxious for somebody. Swain. Mr. Ingram had once compared the English climate to unregenerated womanhood, and had declaimed on this subject in his own whimsical fashion at Cleveland Terrace, much to the delight of his young friend the humorist. It is womanhood pure and simple, and unadulterated by civilization, he continued, blandly, as he twisted his Mephistophelian moustache. It is the savage mother, and no mistake, with all her crude grand humours, Sometimes she is benevolent, fairly brimming over with the milk of loving-kindness. She has her sportive moods, when she bubbles over with smiles and mirth, a May Day, for example, when she walks through the land as meekly as a garlanded lamb. "'Here, here,' observed Noel, sotto voce, but Molly, who was deeply impressed, frowned him down. Mr. Ingram paused as though for a well-deserved applause. He felt himself becoming eloquent, so he took up his parable again. But the savage mother knows how to sulk and frown, and her tear-storms and icy moods are terribly trying. There is no coquetry about her then. It is the storm and stress of a great passion, and with this grand peroration Mr. Ingram gave his moustache a final twist, and as Noel phrased it, brought the house down. Waveney thought of Monsieur Blackie's parable, for of course it had been duly retailed to her in Molly's weekly budget, when the weather changed disastrously before Christmas. The frost king no longer touched the earth with his white fingers, the wintry sunshine had faded from the landscape, the skies were grey and threatening, and the raw cold made one's flesh creep. Hardly Christmas weather, 
Althea observed, regretfully, as she looked out from the library window at the blackened grass and sodden, uninviting paths. Only under the wide veranda of the porch house a crowd of birds were feeding. Waveney was, as usual, watching them. "'I am afraid it will rain before evening,' returned Doreen. "'The barometer is going down fast. I do so dislike a wet Christmas.' and to this Althea cordially agreed. But no amount of impending rain could damp Waveney's pleasurable expectations, for she had a delightful program before her. That year Christmas Day fell on Saturday, and as Althea and Doreen always dined with Mrs. Mainwaring, Althea proposed driving her to Cleveland Terrace. "'And Sarah would be delighted to see you, dear,' she said. "'Indeed, you were included in the invitation, but I told her that you would far rather be with your own people. Oh, thank you, thank you, returned the girl gratefully, but her joy was unbounded when Althea suggested that she should not return to the Red House until Tuesday afternoon. I shall need all my helpers then, she finished, smiling, and Waveney understood her. The Christmas program had been duly unfolded to her. There was to be a grand tea and entertainment for Althea's girls at the porch house, a festive evening in the home for workers, a supper for the Dereham cabmen, and another for the costermongers, and on Twelfth Night the servants at the Red House always entertained their relations and friends in the recreation hall. In fact, as Doreen expressed it, no one would have time to sit down comfortably until the Feast of the Epiphany had passed. But though Doreen spoke in a resigned tone of a weary worker, it might be doubted if anyone enjoyed more thoroughly the bustle and preparation. The day before Christmas was a busy one for all the inmates of the Red House. Doreen was at the home all day superintending the Christmas decorations, and Althea spent most of her time at the porch house, where a band of voluntary helpers were making garlands of evergreens and framing Christmas mottoes in ivy under her skilful direction. Waveney would willingly have helped in the work, but Althea had other employment for her. Some of her pensioners lived on the other side of the river, and Waveney, who often acted as her almoner, went off early in the afternoon to order parcels of groceries and other good things, and to carry them to two or three old women who lived in the almshouses. The old women were garrulous, and detained her with accounts of their various ailments, so it was quite dark before the little gate of the almshouse garden closed behind her. For some time she had heard the pattering of the rain against the window panes, and knew that she would have a long, wet walk home. "'Ay, but it is a wild night,' observed Mrs. Bates, lugubriously, as she stirred her bright little fire afresh, "'and it makes one shiver to one's very bones, that it do. "'But your warm shawl will be a comfort,' returned Waveney, cheerfully. "'Well, I must go now. A happy Christmas to you, Mrs. Bates,' and I hope your rheumatism will soon be better. And then Waveney unhasped the upper half of Widow Bates' door and peered out into the darkness. It was not inviting, certainly. The cold, sleety rain was falling in torrents. A wild night, assuredly, and one that meant mischief. But Waveney wore a stout, waterproof cloak that Althea had lent to her, and thought she would be proof against any amount of rain or sleet. True, her umbrella was just a little slit, but she would soon have it recovered. A narrow, winding passage resembling a cathedral close led to High Street. A few old-fashioned houses fronted the garden wall of the vicarage. Here it was so dark that Waveney was rather startled when she heard a child's voice close to her elbow. "'Oh, please, I am quite lost, and will you take me home?' There was something familiar in the voice, but in the darkness it was impossible to see the child's face. 
but Waveney's ear was never deaf to any childish appeal. "'Oh, you poor little thing,' she said kindly. "'Where do you live, and what is your name?' "'I am Dad's little Betty,' returned the child. She spoke in a tired, dreary little tone. "'And I live across the water, past the church, with Uncle Theo and Aunt Joa. Then, in spite of the wet, Waveney stooped down and put her arm around her. "'Why, it is my little friend Betty,' she said in a puzzled tone. "'Why are you out alone this dreadful night? Oh, you poor darling! Your frock and jacket are quite soaking. Come, come, we must go home as fast as possible. Give me your hand, dear, and come closer to me, so that my umbrella may shelter you. Is it my little lady?' asked betty in a perplexed voice she did speak to me so kindly once on the seat by the river but i have never never seen her again but we shall see each other presently when we get to the shops returned waveney cheerily betty darling tell me why are you out by yourself i wanted to meet dad returned betty with a little sob aunt joa was out and i was so lonely all by myself and jemima was busy and told me to run away and i was aching dreadful because it was christmas eve and dad did not come and i thought and bet sobbed afresh it would be such fun to see him pass me and then i should call out loud here's bet dad and i have come to meet you but there was no dad at all yes and then you missed your way it was so dark returned bet plaintively and there were trees and i fell down and hurt myself and then i got frightened are you frightened in the dark too no i am only frightened of doing wrong things betty dear i am afraid you have been very naughty and that poor aunt joa will be anxious can you walk faster darling but bet tired and miserable felt as though her poor little legs were weighted with lead but for the umbrella waveney would have carried her it hurt her to hear the child sobbing to herself quietly in the darkness it was a cruel night for any child to be out mr ingram's savage mother was in her fiercest mood and seemed lashing herself up to fresh fury there was scarcely a foot passenger to be seen on the bridge but a few shivering men and women were in the town making their christmas purchases bet cheered up a little when the bridge had been crossed we shall soon be there now she sighed do you know my home little lady yes dear and i know your aunt joa too and your uncle theo and dad no darling not dad but i dare say i shall know him some day see how pretty all those lights look yes this is the house as betty pulled at her hand and the next moment they were standing on the doorstep to waveney's surprise mr chater opened the door he regarded them with amazement waveney's old umbrella had not fulfilled its mission and the velvet on her hat was soaking and so was her hair but she was nothing to betty in the lamplight she looked like the most abject little child possible she was splashed with mud from head to foot and her plate of fair hair was so wet that mr chater hurriedly withdrew his hand why she is wet through he said in a shocked voice then waveney hurriedly explained matters i'm afraid betty has been rather naughty she said quickly she went out by herself in the hope of meeting her father and then she lost herself and got frightened she was just by elmer's almshouses when she spoke to me elmer's almshouses across the river he exclaimed quite horrified why i thought she was with my sister what are we to do miss ward looking at her with all a man's helplessness joanna may not be back for an hour and jemima has gone to the general post office 
and the child is dripping with wet from head to foot. Waveney was quite equal to the emergency. I think, if you will allow me, I had better take her upstairs, she returned quietly, and get off her wet things. If you could get her something hot to drink, milk or tea, anything, so that it is hot. Then Mr. Chater looked relieved. I could make her a cup of tea, he returned, if you are sure that will do. The kettle is boiling now. Thank you very much, was all Waveney answered. Now, Betty dear, will you show me the way to your room? I sleep in Aunt Joa's room, replied Betty, making brave efforts to restrain her tears. Her poor little lips were blue with cold, and her teeth were chattering, and her fingers were so numb that they could not turn the handle of the door, and Waveney had to come to her help. It was a large, pleasant room, furnished simply, and a bright fire gave it an air of comfort. A child's cot stood beside the bed. There were some fine old prints on the walls, and the silver and ebony brush on the toilet table, and the quilted silk eiderdown on her bed spoke of better days. Waveney took off her dripping waterproof and hat, and then she set to work and in five minutes Betty's wet things lay in a heap on the floor, and she was wrapped up in her aunt's warm flannel dressing gown, and ensconced in the big easy chair. Then Waveney sat down on a rug and rubbed the frozen little feet. Betty, she said coaxingly, I do wish you would be a good child and go straight to bed. But Betty puckered up her face at this, and looked so miserable that Waveney did not dare to say more. "'It's my dad's birthday, and Christmas Eve,' she said in a heartbroken voice. "'Dad would not enjoy his tea one bit unless I buttered his toast and gave him his two lumps of sugar. "'Well, then, you must tell me where to find you some dry, clean clothes,' returned Waveney, with a disapproving shake of her head. But just then there was a tap at the door, and when she said, Come in, to her surprise, Mr. Chater entered with two large cups of steaming tea in his hands. Jemima is still playing truant, he said apologetically, so I was obliged to bring the tea myself. And then he set down the cups on a little table, piling up Joanna's small possessions in a most ruthless fashion to make room for them. Perhaps the novelty of the situation bewildered him, or something in the little fireside scene appealed to him, for he stood beside Betty's chair for two or three minutes without speaking. Betty, in her scarlet dressing gown, was certainly a most picturesque-looking little object, but Thorold's eyes rested longer on the girlish figure on the rug, at the busy ministering hands, and the damp, curly hair still glistening with wet. "'Do please drink your tea before it cools,' he said pleadingly. "'When Jemima comes back, I shall send her up to help you, and clear all the wet things away.' And then he went downstairs, and set on the kettle again to boil, and all the while the memory of a bare little foot resting on a girl's soft pink palm haunted him. It is the eternal motherhood, he said to himself, that is, in all true women. No wonder Bet loves her. How could she help it? How could she help it? And then the doorbell rang, and Jemima entered with profuse apologies at her tardiness. She was sent upstairs with a supply of hot water and towels, and as soon as Betty had finished her tea, her face and hands were washed, her hair dried, and neatly tied with a ribbon. Then she was dressed in clean, fresh garments. I have got my best frock on, and I feel quite nice and like Christmas Eve, exclaimed Betty with a quaint little caper. Oh, I am sure Dad must have come, and Aunt Joa too. Do let us go downstairs. Let me wash my hands first, darling, pleaded Waveney, and oh, dear, how untidy I look. 
and Betty stood by the toilet table watching with critical eyes while Waveney tried to bring the unruly locks into order. "'Aunt Joa has such long, long hair,' she observed. "'When she sits down, it almost touches the floor. But yours is nice baby hair, too. It is like little rings that have come undone. But it is pretty, don't you think so?' feeling that Waveney must be the best judge of such a personal matter. Jemima giggled as she picked up the little muddy boots. "'Law, Miss Bet,' she said reprovingly, "'how you do talk! No little ladies that I ever knew said such things. There's your pa. He is downstairs and a-waiting for his tea.' But Bet heard no more. "'Come, come,' she said, pulling Waveney by the dress, Dad is downstairs, and the curls don't matter one bit. Then Waveney reluctantly followed her. Her hat and gloves were drying. She could not possibly put them on for another half hour, and she could hardly stay ruminating in Miss Chater's bedroom. Joanna had not yet returned. She was evidently weather-bound at some friend's house, but a good-looking, weather-beaten man in a rough grey coat stood with his back to the fire. Bet ran to him at once. "'Oh, Dad, I did so want to be ready for you, but I got wet, and the little lady was helping me to dress up again.' "'Yes, I know, Bet.' And then her father kissed her a little gravely, and held out his hand to Waveney. "'I am very grateful to you, Miss Ward. My brother has been telling me of your kindness to my little girl. She has been a very naughty child, I am afraid.' Then Bet looked up in his face, and her lip quivered. "'Was it really bad of me to go out there and meet you, Dad? Really and truly?' "'Yes, darling, really and truly.' And then Tristram took her on his knee. "'What would Dad have done without his little Betty? And she might have been lost or run over.' "'Oh, I would have found my way back,' returned Bet with a wise little nod of her head. "'But I won't never do it again.' And then her little arms went round his neck, and she rested her head against the rough grey coat, for her childish heart was full to the brim. "'Miss Ward,' observed Thorold, in rather a pleading voice, "'as my sister is absent, may I ask you to pour out the tea?' Then Waveney blushing a little at the unexpected request, took her place quietly at the tea tray. End of chapter 24chapter 25 of Molly's Prince This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Riley. Molly's Prince by Rosa Nouche Carey. Chapter 25. A Wet Night and a Difference of Opinion. I am Sir Oracle, and when I ope my lips, let no dog bark. Merchant of Venice. Beggar I am. I am even poor in thanks. Hamlet What a strange Christmas Eve it was! Waveney felt as though she were in a dream, as she sat there demurely pouring out the tea, with Betty beside her, counting the lumps of sugar in each cup. Two for Daddy, and one big one for Uncle Theo? Oh, that is not big enough, is it, Uncle Theo? And, oh dear! in a reproachful voice. You did put in the milk first. I shall know better next time, returned Waveney, smiling, and then she watched Betty spreading her father's toast with butter. The child's concentrated earnestness, her absorbed gravity, amused her, but Tristram evidently took it as a matter of course. What a cosy room it was, Waveney thought. The crimson curtains were drawn, and a bright fire burnt in both fireplaces, an unwanted extravagance, in honour of Christmas Eve, 
the circle of easy chairs round the farthest fireplace looked snug and inviting thorold did not talk much during tea-time he left the conversation principally to his brother but he often looked at the little figure that occupied joanna's place his fastidious eyes noticed the neat dainty movements and the changes of expression on the bright speaking face and the lovely dimple when waveney smiled or laughed a man could hardly be dull with such a companion he thought and then at some sudden suggestion some overwhelming possibility a dull flush rose to his temples and he went to the window to inspect the weather i am sorry to say that it is still raining miss ward he said quietly and i am afraid we are in for a wet night but i will get you a cab a cab interrupted waveney in a dismayed tone oh no thank you mr chater you must do nothing of the kind i am as strong as a lion and i never take cold at least scarcely ever and what does a little rain matter you are a stoic he returned somewhat amused at this but she seemed so horrified at his suggestion that he said no more being a man of deeds not words so when waveney took possession of an easy chair and betty brought her her baby doll to admire she felt comfortably convinced that she would be allowed her own way but she had reckoned without her host waveney chatted happily to the child while tristram watched them with the lazy enjoyment of a tired man and she never wondered why mr chater was absent so long until he re-entered the room in his ulster the cab is here miss ward he said coolly and you will find your things in my sister's room jemima says they are quite dry then waveney only flashed a look of reproach at him and walked meekly out of the room of course he was right she knew that and that the idea of the long lonely walk in the pelting rain was absurd in the highest degree but as waveney went upstairs she was not sure that she liked the quiet way in which mr chater asserted his will it made her feel like a little schoolgirl in the presence of a master he had not taken the trouble to argue the point with her or to prove to her that she had made a mistake but had just gone out and brought the cab and so waveney who in spite of her sweet temper was a trifle self-willed and obstinate felt secretly aggrieved and even offended and she entered the parlour with so dignified an air that thorold who could read her face smiled to himself Betty ran to her with a sorrowful exclamation. "'Oh, must you go, Wavy dear?' she said dubiously. "'Why, Bet,' observed her uncle, rather shocked at this familiarity, "'aren't you taking rather a liberty with your kind friend?' "'She told me her name,' returned Bet, in eager defence. "'And she did say that I might call her what I liked. I know it was Wavy.' or something like that very like it indeed darling replied waveney kneeling down and putting her arms round the child and it is prettier than waveney and i shall always want you to call me so now good night my little betty and then as betty clung to her and kissed her thorold looked at them rather gravely i am ready now observed waveney resuming her stiff manner i suppose it will be no use telling you mr chater that i can very well go by myself no he returned looking at her with very keen bright eyes i am afraid your words would be wasted you see miss ward i have a conscience and my conscience tells me that i ought to see you safe in miss harford's hands but to this waveney vouchsafed no reply she jumped into the cab and settled herself in her corner and left mr chater to dispose of himself as he would and when he placed himself opposite to her she only looked out intently at the lighted shops even the rain could not quite damp the festivity 
the snow-white turkeys and geese garlanded with holly made a brave show and the butcher's shop was full of shabby customers waveney's soft heart yearned as usual over the babies and little children then she turned her head and met mr chater's amused glance it was so kind it spoke of such complete understanding that she felt a little ashamed of herself miss ward have you forgiven me yet for doing my duty like a man waveney struggled with a smile but she had not quite recovered herself so she said rather coldly i don't see that my forgiveness matters a bit is not that rather crushing he returned especially as it matters very much to me i wish you would be friendly enough to tell me the real cause of offence you could not reasonably expect that i should let you swim through this the rain beating an accompaniment to his words i would not have let my sister do it his voice softening into involuntary tenderness never had she seemed so lovable to him even though her childish waywardness was making him smile it was not the cab i minded so much stammered waveney tingling with shame and confusion to her finger ends and glad of the darkness that hid her hot cheeks only you did it without telling me waveney did not dare say what she really thought that he had managed her like a child and it makes me unhappy it does indeed mr chater to bring you out this dreadful night when you are so tired and have been hard at work all day i never felt less tired in my life and you are giving me great pleasure in allowing me to perform this little service for you then waveney blushed again but this time for pleasure for mr chater's voice convinced her that he was speaking the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth now we have had our first and last little difference he went on cheerfully and shall be better friends than ever and there was no outward dissent to this only a mutinous sparkle in waveney's dark eyes showed a silent protest would it be their last difference she thought for she was a shrewd sensible little woman and had her own opinions on most things but at least she had the grace and honesty to own that on this occasion she had been in the wrong what a short drive it was after all almost before waveney had seen that they were at the top of the hill they were driving through the lodge gates althea came out into the hall to meet them in her heliotrope velveteen and lace ruff she looked more like queen bess than ever my dear child i have been so anxious about you but of course i hoped you had taken shelter thank you for bringing her home thorold will you come in or is your cab waiting we have our usual mulled wine and christmas cake which you ought to taste for the sake of the old lang syne may i give the cabman some poor old fellow he is so cold but it was a mere form of words he need not have asked the question on christmas eve not an errand boy or a carol singer left the red house without being regaled with christmas fare cakes and ale as althea and doreen called it the world carried out a great mug of hot spiced wine and a mighty wedge of cake to the driver then he took his by the hall fire as he said he was too wet and dirty for the library waveney found him there alone when she came downstairs fresh pensioners were claiming the sister's attention he looked warmed and refreshed and recommended her to follow his example see what a treat you have given me miss ward he said smiling there is no mulled wine like this anywhere the flavour brings back my dear old home to me do you mean the old manor house she asked softly yes he returned dreamily it is the season for old memories is it not at christmas and new year's day the ghosts of the past stalk out of their dim recesses 
but they are dearly loved visitants, and we do not fear them. Do you know what the Germans call Heimweh? Have you ever experienced it? But he need not have asked, for at the unexpected question the girl's head drooped to hide her tears. How could he know, how could anyone know, how that brave young heart ached ceaselessly for her home and Molly? Mr. Chater was quite shocked at himself. "'Dear Miss Ward,' he said gently, "'you must forgive me again, you see, but I spoke without thinking.' Then Waveney shook her head and looked at him with a touching little smile. "'You have done nothing. It is only I who am silly tonight. But, oh, I am always so wanting father and Molly, but I shall see them to-morrow. Mr. Chater, I must go now, but thank you so much for all your kindness and for bringing me home. I am not ungrateful, really.' and Waveney's wet eyes looked so sad and beautiful as she raised them to his face that Mr. Chater thought of them all through his drive home. When Waveney woke the next morning, she found the rain had ceased, but it was still too dark to discover anything further. They drove to church for the early service, and the warm, lighted church, with its Christmas decorations, and crowded with worshippers, reminded her of the dearly loved church where she and Molly had knelt side by side for so many years. Breakfast was ready for them on their return, and they had the usual noisy welcome from fuss and fury. But Waveney was a little perplexed when Althea told her, with a smile, that she must eat her breakfast as quickly as possible, as they had plenty of business before them. It is a comfort the rain has stopped, she continued, with an irrepressible shiver, for we cannot possibly have the carriage out again until we drive to town. How thankful I am that Aunt Sarah gave me that fur-lined cloak last Christmas, she went on, addressing her sister. It keeps out the cold as nothing else does. I feel as cosy as that robin does in his red waistcoat. Waveney ate her breakfast a little silently. She was wondering why there was no greeting word from home. Perhaps the postman had not come. "'Have you finished, Waveney?' asked Doreen a little abruptly. "'By and by, if you have, we may as well go to the library, or we shall never get our parcels undone before it is time to start for church.' Waveney opened her eyes rather widely at this but when she entered the room she stared in amazement. The center table seemed a mass of plants, and brown paper parcels of every size and description were heaped on every available space. To her surprise, Althea quietly drew back the curtain of Cozy Nook and motioned her to enter. "'You can amuse yourself there for a little while,' she said brightly, "'while Doreen and I open our parcels.' You will see Aunt Sarah has not forgotten you. And then, with a kindly nod, she withdrew. It was a pity that no interested observer saw the girl's start and blush of delight, for there, just opposite her, was a dress flung across a chair and a paper pinned on one sleeve. Waveney, from her loving friend, Althea Harford. Althea had pleased her own taste in the choice of that frock. It was a dark sapphire blue velveteen of the same shade as the cloak, and was perfectly plain except for a dainty little ruff of yellowish lace, and nothing could have suited Waveney's pale little face better. She stood for a long time with folded hands, in mute admiration of that marvellous garment, she knew now why her white dress had disappeared so mysteriously for a day or two. It wanted doing up, Nurse Marks told her, but when it had been returned, Waveney could see very little difference. The poor little frock looked sadly frayed and shabby. No wonder Miss Althea thought she needed a new one, but the kindness and the generosity of the gift were beyond everything and there was a lump in Waveney's throat as her fingers touched the soft pile of the velveteen. 
Doreen's present was a box of handkerchiefs, with Waveney's initials prettily embroidered by one of the workers at the home, and Mrs. Mainwaring, with characteristic kindness and good taste, had contributed a beautiful little muff. But Waveney's pleasure reached its climax when her eyes discovered a neat little umbrella with a note from Molly attached to the ivory handle. "'Please do not think me extravagant, darling,' it began, "'because I really can afford to give myself a big treat this year. "'The menu cards have sold splendidly. "'Mr. Ingram says his sister has given him a commission for three more sets, "'so I shall be quite rich. "'I have bought myself a new jacket and hat.' and father says that he certainly means to get me a tweed dress for Christmas, so I shall be as smart as you. He is only sending you gloves, but I know you will like them. And I have bought the umbrella out of my own earnings. You cannot think how proud I am of that. The poor old gamp you were using would not keep a sparrow dry. It was so worn out, and I could not bear to think of you getting wet through. A happy Christmas to you, my darling, and no more at present from your loving Molly. Noel's present was wrapped up with the gloves. It was only a small manuscript book, neatly bound with blue ribbon, and in Noel's flourishing schoolboy hand was written, The Further Adventures of Monsieur Blackie, by a humorist, and dedicated with the author's compliments to old storm and stress. Ten minutes later, when Althea peeped through the curtain, she found Waveney still hugging her umbrella, while she looked over the pen and ink sketches, with eyes twinkling with amusement. "'Do you think it will fit?' she asked softly. Then the girl started to her feet, her face crimson with emotion. "'Oh, Miss Althea, how am I to thank you?' she exclaimed. "'You are too kind!' oh far too kind to me and then almost tearfully i have nothing to give you in return nothing i thought i saw a pretty pen wiper among my parcels but i suppose i must have dreamt it and i had an impression that doreen showed me a needle book oh but they were only trifles my dear no gift however small from one who loves us is a trifle, and I shall value your present. We have all we want, dear child, and the kindness of our friends almost embarrasses us. When you come back, I must show you all the beautiful things some of the girls have made for me, but there is no time to look at them now, for the church bells are ringing. And then, as they went upstairs, Waveney laden with her treasures, the crowning touch was put to her day's pleasure. "'I am so glad you like your frock, dear,' remarked Althea. "'It is certainly seasonable for winter evenings. You will find a parcel in your room directed to Molly. It contains a similar dress for her. And the flash of joy in Waveney's eyes certainly repaid her.'" End of chapter 25「Chapter 26 of Molly's Prince」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Molly's Prince by Rosa Nouchette Carey A White Vellum Pocket Book And there's pansies, that's for thoughts. Hamlet There'll be a comfort in fire. There'll be a welcome for somebody. One in her neatest attire will look to the table for somebody. Swain. It was in the gathering dusk of the afternoon when Waveney found herself in the neighbourhood of Cleveland Terrace. They had driven fast, and yet to the eager girl the way had seemed strangely long. As they approached the house, Althea shivered a little, as though her fur-lined cloak had suddenly lost its robin-like coziness. The steely winter sky, the raw dampness of the atmosphere, the gloom of the half-light which made all objects appear out of due proportion and gave them a hazy indistinctness 
made her feel depressed and uncomfortable. As the carriage stopped, the door was quickly opened, though not by the footman, and a familiar voice in the darkness said, Thank you, Miss Harford, a thousand times for bringing the child home. Waveney, my darling, a happy Christmas to you. Run out of the cold, dear. It is beginning to snow. But Waveney kept her place. I must say good night first, father. Were you watching for me? Do you know you have not wished the dear ladies a happy Christmas yet? Then Althea's gentle, melancholy voice interrupted her. Dear child, there was no need to remind your father of an idle form. I'm quite sure we have his good wishes for the sake of the old down sign. You're bareheaded, Mr. Ward. Do please go in. And a slim, gloved hand was stretched out to him. Everard bowed over it as he pressed it warmly. You will always have my best wishes, he said very gravely. Good night, Miss Harford. Good night, and thank you, Miss Althea. And then he swung open the gate and went up the little courtyard, with Waveney clinging to his arm. Althea looked after them with wistful eyes. What a stream of light met them. What did the narrow passage and steep, ladder-like stairs matter, or the frayed and dingy drogating, when that starlight glow of home radiance beamed so brightly? And indeed, when Waveney felt Molly's arms round her neck, and her warm cheek pressed against hers, her heart was comforted and at rest. "'Where are you taking me, sweetheart?' she asked softly, as Molly dragged her past the studio door. You must come upstairs and take off your things first, returned Molly, panting from her exertions. We shall have tea in the dining room tonight, because there are muffins and crumpets, and I must see to them. Then Molly threw open the bedroom door, and stood still in silent enjoyment, to see Waveney's start of surprise at the sight of a splendid fire burning in the grate. Oh, Molly, she said, quite shocked at this extravagance, have we ever had a fire here before, except when we had the measles? Then Molly laughed and shook her head. I dare say not, but I was not going to let you sleep in this cold vault for three nights when you have been used to a lovely fire in your pansy room. Why, Wave, you absurd child, how grave you look. Father won't have to pay one penny for it. I put two shillings into the housekeeping purse out of my own money, and we will just have a beautiful fire every night, and won't we enjoy ourselves? It feels lovely, returned Waveney, kneeling down on the rug, for she was chilly from the long drive. No, don't light the gas, dear. The firelight is so pretty. Then Molly put down the matchbox reluctantly. I wanted to show you something, she returned in a low voice. But perhaps if you make a blaze, you will be able to see it. Oh, what is that? As Waveney mutely held out a long brown paper parcel. Is that another present? No, please don't open it. You must look at this one first. And then Molly, with outward gravity and much inward excitement, laid a beautiful Russian leather writing case on the rug for Waveney's inspection. Never had Waveney seen such a case, so dainty, so complete, so perfectly finished. The initials M.W. were on everything, the silver paper knife and pen holders, and on the tiny card case and inkstand, and every card and sheet of paper was stamped with Molly's address. Waveney was silent from excess of admiration, and also from a strong feeling of emotion, only a lover, she thought, could have planned all those pretty finishes and details. Surely, surely Molly's eyes must be open now. Molly, dear, I really don't know what to say, she answered at last when the silence became embarrassing. It is really too beautiful for anyone but Cinderella. Then a little conscious smile came to Molly's lips, and her cheeks wore their wild rose flush, and yes, certainly there was a new wistfulness in her eyes. Was it not splendid of Mr. Ingram, she said. But her voice was not quite steady. It was so kind that I could not help crying a little, and then Father laughed at me. I can't understand Father Wave. When I asked him if I ought to write and thank Mr. Ingram, he got quite red, and said that I must know my own feelings best. It was so odd of Father to say that. Did Mr. Ingram write to you, Molly? No, returned Molly with her cheeks a still deeper rose. There was only a slip of paper, with Monsieur Blackie's good wishes. But Wave, he is not coming back for a long time, he told me so. He said society had claims on him, and that he had a house party impending and other engagements. But I did not like to question him. 
"Well, then, I suppose you had better write only just a short note, Mollie. And pray, pray do not be too grateful. If he gives you presents, it is to please himself as well as you. But you do not know his address, you silly child. No, returned Mollie with a sigh. That is one of his mysteries. He calls himself a nebulous personage. If you ever want to write to me, he said the last time he came. If your father breaks his leg, for example, or my friend the humorist plays another one of his tricks and requires chastisement, and the strong arm of the law, you can ask my cousin Althea to send on the letter for you. Is that not a funny roundabout way? Rather, returned Waveney dryly, feeling as though she were on the edge of a volcano. I think, Molly dear, that under these circumstances it would be better not to write, but just wait and thank Mr. Ingram when he comes. And though Molly looked a little disappointed at this decision, she agreed, with her usual loyalty, to abide by it. When the new dress had been duly admired, and Miss Althea praised to Waveney's entire satisfaction, they went downstairs to begin their Christmas merry-making in earnest. Noel, who was always the lord of misrule on these occasions, had insisted with much severity on the usual program being carried out. So they had Snapdragon in a dark dining room after tea, and Molly as usual burnt her fingers. And then they went up to the studio and acted charades and dumb crambos for an appreciative audience. Mr. Ward, who occupied the front row, and Anne and Mrs. Muggins, who represented the pit. Laws, miss, ain't it beautiful and lifelike, observed Anne, the heavy-footed, for the twentieth time. But Everett's eyes were a little misty. If only Dorothy could have seen them, he thought. And then his imagination flew off at a tangent to his old friend, Althea Hartford. All the evening her soft, melancholy voice had haunted him. For the sake of old Anne's sign, she had said, and her tone had been full of pathos. She has never forgotten. I think she is one of those women who never forget, he thought, but he sighed as he said it. To Waveney, those three days were simply perfect, and every hour brought its enjoyment. On Sunday afternoon, a snowstorm kept them prisoners to the house, and there was no evening church, so they sang carols by the fire instead. And Anne sat on the stairs with Mrs. Muggins on her lap, and an old plaid shawl of her mother's to keep her warm, and listened as devoutly as though she were in the vestibule of heaven. "'Which is my opinion, Miss Waveney,' she observed afterwards, "'as the Sadducees and the Pharisees could not have sang more sweetly, not with all their golden harps neither.' Waveney looked puzzled for a moment, but Anne's idiosyncrasies were too well known in the household, and after a moment of silent reflection she said, "'I see what you mean, Anne.' You were thinking of the cherubim and sephirim, and it is a fine compliment you are paying us. And then she went off to share the little joke with Molly and Noel, and the peals of laughter that reached Anne's ears somewhat perplexed the stolid maiden. On Monday they woke to a white world, and then there was snow bowling in the back garden, and then a long walk down Sheen Walk and across the bridge to Battersea Park. And Molly went with them, on her father's arm, and when she got tired, which she did far too soon, Noel took her home, grumbling at every step. Waveney and her father went on. It was ever as greatest pleasure to walk with his girls, but no companion suited him like Waveney. Her light, springy step hardly seemed to touch the ground, and then she was so strong and active, and nothing seemed to tire her. Molly's sad limp always made his heart ache. As they stood looking at some floating ice in the river, Everard asked a little abruptly if Molly had written to Mr. Ingram. Waveney shook her head. The question rather surprised her. Why, no, father, she replied slowly. We do not know Mr. Ingram's address, so I persuaded Molly to wait until he calls. Well, perhaps you're right, returned Mr. Ward doubtfully. But Waveney, child, I am getting a little bothered about things. I like the fellow. I like him better every time I see him. He has real grit in him and he is a gentleman, but I never saw a girl courted after this fashion. "'What do you mean, father?' asked Waveney a little timidly, for she and Molly were not at all up to date, and their shyness and reticence on the subject were quite old-fashioned. "'Why, any child can see that Ingram worships the ground Molly walks on,' returned Mr. Ward, with a touch of impatience in his voice. When she looked at him with her big, innocent eyes, he stammered and changed colour more than once. "'Oh, the man is in earnest. I would take my oath on that.' It is Molly's side of the question I want to know. She ought not to encourage him by taking his presence unless she means to have him. 
This was plain speaking, but Mr. Ward was getting desperate. His motherless girls had no protector but himself. It was pretty to see how Waveney blushed on Molly's account. Father, dear, she stammered, I can't be quite sure, but I think Molly is beginning to care a little for Mr. Ingram. She certainly misses him. He is very keen and clever. And I fancy that he understands her so well that he will not hurry things. I mean, explaining herself with difficulty, that he will not speak until he is certain that her heart is won. That is my opinion, too, returned her father. And then he looked at her with tender curiosity. Where did you gain your knowledge of men, little girl? But Waveney had no answer ready for this question. That night, as they sat on the rug in the firelight, like two blissful salamanders, Molly said, in a flurried and anxious voice, Wave, darling, I want to consult you about something, and you must give me all your attention, you know, clearing her throat as though it were a little dry. We have decided that I had better not write to Mr. Ingram. Oh, yes, Molly, we decided long, long ago. Waveney spoke in a calm and judicial voice, but Molly only grew more flurried. But I must do something to please him, she returned, in quite a distressed tone. Think of all the pleasure he has given me, Wave. I have got such a lovely idea in my head. I have finished the menu cards, and I want to paint one of these white vellum pocket books for Mr. Ingram. A spray of purple pansies would look so well on it. And I will have it all ready for him when he comes next. Don't you think he will be pleased, Wave? Of course he will be pleased, sweetheart. He would carry it next to his heart and sleep with it under his pillow. But this nonsense was received rather pettishly. I wish you would be serious when a person asks advice, returned Molly with a little frown. You would not like anyone to say those silly things to you. Then Waveney was on her best behaviour at once, and the naughty, mischievous sparkle faded out of her eyes. Don't be cross, Molly, darling, she said caressingly. I do think your idea very pretty, and I should think Mr. Ingram will be very pleased. He does admire your painting so. Why have you selected pansies, I wonder? Then, at this very simple question, Molly looked a little confused. They're his favourite flowers, she almost whispered. He says you can never have too much hard seas in this world. And this answer fully satisfied Waveney. The next morning they started off to Sloane Street to purchase the pocket book, and Molly expended the last of her earnings. And the moment Waveney left her to return to Erpingham, she sat down to her little painting table and worked until the short winter's afternoon closed in. Waveney did not see it until it was finished, and then her admiration fully satisfied Molly. It was a charming design, and a pansy with a broken stalk, dropping from the main cluster, had a very graceful effect. "'Father likes it. He says I have never painted anything better,' observed Molly, with modest pride, and Waveney cordially endorsed this. Privately, she thought the dainty pocketbook was more fit for some youthful bride. "'Mr. Ingram could not possibly use it,' she said to herself. He will put it under a glass case, or lock it up in a drawer. And if Molly ever writes love letters to him, he will keep them in his pansy book. And then she smiled to herself, as she thought of his delight when Molly, with many blushes and much incoherence, should hand him the book. She could almost see the flash of pleasure in his eyes. But as her lively imagination pictured the little scene, she was far from guessing under what different circumstances Ingram would receive his pansy book. End of chapter 26About three weeks after Christmas, Althea was sitting alone in her library. The great room felt strangely empty that morning. There was no curly head to be seen bending over the writing table in Cozy Nook. No girl secretary to answer the silver chiming of Althea's little bell. Waveney and Doreen had gone up to town for a day shopping, leaving Althea to enjoy the rest that she so sorely needed. The severe round of Christmas feastings, the lavish dispensing of cakes and ale, would have tried a robust constitution, 
and even Doreen complained of unwanted fatigue. But Althea, highly strung and sensitive, had to pay the usual penalty for overexertion by one of her painful eye attacks, which lasted for three or four days, leaving her weak and depressed. It is strange and sad how mind and body react on each other in these attacks. A grey haze, misty and impalpable, seemed to veil Althea's inner world and blot out her cheerfulness. The free, healthy current of her thoughts was checked by dimly discerned obstacles. A chilling sense of self-distrust, of rashly undertaken work, made her heart heavy. It is brain sickness, Doreen would say to comfort her. It will pass, my dear. Yes, it will pass, returned Althea with passive gentleness. I know that as well as you do, Dory, but for the time it masters me. Althea ill and Althea well seem two different persons. Is it not humiliating, dear, to think we are at the mercy of our overwrought nerves? A trifling ailment, a little bodily discomfort, and if we were at heaven's very gate, we drop to earth like the lark. Into our nest, returned Doreen with a smile. You have chosen too cheerful a simile. Larks soar perpetually, and they sing as they soar. I think I am more like a blind mole at the present moment, replied Althea, pushing up her shade a little, that she might see her sister's face. Dory, I am ashamed of myself. I deserve any amount of scolding. I try to count out my blessings, to think of my girls' happy faces, but I am fast in my slow of despond, and not all your efforts will pull me out. Very well, then, we must leave you there, returned Doreen composedly. But she gave Althea's hand a loving little squeeze as she said this. Her heart was full of tenderness and sympathy, but she was too sensible to waste words fruitlessly. These sick moods were purely physical, and would yield, she knew well, to time and rest. They were trials to be borne, part of Althea's life discipline, the cloud that checkered their home cheerfulness, for these melancholy moods seemed to pervade the whole house. Althea felt much as usual that morning, though she had not quite recovered her looks. Her face seemed longer and more sallow, and there were tired lines round her eyes. When a woman has passed her youth, mental suffering leaves an indelible mark, and Althea looked old and worn that day, more like Queen Elizabeth's wraith than ever. I am very idle, she was saying to herself, but I feel that not one of the books that ever were written would interest me today. I have no spirit or energy for travels. History is too full of war and bloodshed, and biography would weary me. A novel? Well, no, I think not. I am not in the mood for other people's love stories. I wish someone would write a novel about elderly people, she went on, middle-aged, prosaic people who have outlived their romance. How soothing such a book would be. I could almost write it myself. There should be plenty of incident, and very little moralizing. And it would be like one of those grey winter days, when the sunlight is veiled in soft vapour, and every window one passes is red with the firelight of home. The fancy pleased her, and she smiled at her own conceit, but it faded in a moment when the doorbell rang. A visitor at this time in the morning, she thought, and a little frown of annoyance gathered on her brow, but it vanished when Mitchell threw open the door and announced Lord Ralston. "'Why, Moritz!' she exclaimed, and her voice was full of surprise and pleasure. "'This is indeed a welcome sight. How long is it since you last honoured our poor abode? Draw that chair up to the fire and give some account of yourself. Even Gwen seems to have forgotten our existence since baby Murdoch made his appearance.' "'Ah, you may well say so.' returned Moritz with a dismal shake of his head. Gwen is incorrigible. I give you my word, Althea, that the beatitude of the young woman is so excessive and so fatuous that it resembles idiocy. She fairly drivels with sentiment over that infant, and he is as ugly and snub-nosed a little chap as Gwen was herself. He has even got her freckles, and she calls them beauty spots, and Lord Ralston's voice expressed unmitigated disgust. Althea laughed. I do not suppose that Madame endorses these sentiments. I should like to hear Mrs. Compton's opinion of her grandson. Well, she vows he is a fine child, and he has got Jack's eyes. 
But all the same, I heard her tell Gwen that a plain baby often became a handsome man. So we can make our own deductions from that. Murdoch has his good points, she went on, and he will improve. And would you believe it, that idiotic Gwen became as red as a turkey cock. There is no improvement wanted, she said indignantly. My precious baby is perfect. He is beautiful in his mother's eyes, whatever his cross old grandmother chooses to say. And then she hugged the little chap and cried over him. And all the time Madam sat beaming on them both, with her fine old face tremulous with happiness. It is Ruth and Naomi over again, finished Moritz. Madame still finds fault with Jack sometimes, but never with Gwen, and the way Gwen toadies her passes belief. Gwendolyn is very happy, certainly. Never was there a better matched couple than she and Jack Compton. Althea spoke in a tone of warm interest. She had forgotten her distaste for other people's love stories at that moment, and the thought of her young cousin's happiness was pleasant to her. Dear Gwen, I am so fond of her. I am glad that one man had the sense to fall in love with her, in spite of her plain face. But you know, Moritz, that I always thought Gwen's ugliness quite charming. Yes, but I could not have done it in Jack's place, returned Moritz rather thoughtfully. I am too great an admirer of beauty. And then he changed the subject a little abruptly. Jack and Gwen and their son and heir have been staying with me at Brentwood. I had a horse party for Christmas and the New Year and I wanted Gwen to play hostess. It was an awful bore, and I got pretty sick of it, but they had both been lecturing me on the duties I owed to my fellow creatures. Well, I have played my Lord Frivol long enough, and now I am playing Mr. Ingram again. What, still masquerading? Isn't it time for you to unmask? But he shook his head. No, not yet. But there is method in my madness. We have not quite completed our little comedy, but I think the closing scene will be effective. He shut his eyes as though to picture the scene, and then opened them abruptly. I have not been to Cleveland Terrace for an age. In fact, I only came up from Brentwood this morning, and on my way up here, I passed Doreen and Miss Ward. Oh, then you knew I was alone? To be sure I did. That is why I appear in my true character. I suppose, his voice changing perceptively, that Miss Molly and her father and my friend the humorist are well? But Moritz did not look at Althea as he put this question, and so did not see the little smile on her lips. They were quite well when Waveney went home on Sunday. She said Molly was a little pale and tired, but then she had been taken too long a walk. She spent a night here on the evening of our girls' entertainment. It was quite amusing to see how they all admired her. She was the May Queen in one of the tableaux. It was the prettiest thing imaginable. I wish I had seen it, and Lord Raston's eyes were dark and bright. If Althea had not guessed the secret long ago, she would have guessed it now. With one of those sudden impulses which were natural to her, she put her hand gently on his arm. Moritz, she said in her sweet womanly way, does Gwen know? Have you made her your confidant? Just for a moment, Moritz drew himself up a little stiffly, as though he resented the question. But the kindness in Althea's eyes disarmed him, and perhaps his need of sympathy was too great. There was no need to tell her, he returned in a low voice. She found it out for herself. Gwen is very acute about such things. And she approves? Oh, we have not come to that point yet, speaking in his old airy manner but she was very much interested, and as good as gold. She laughed at me a little for what she called my fantastic chivalry, but all the same she seemed to like it. But, Moritz, why are you so afraid of appearing in your true colours? I do not see that this Count Ralston is a less interesting person than Mr. Ingram. Perhaps not, he returned dryly, but we all have our whims. I am an idealist, you must remember that, and I have a wish to stand on my own merits as a man and not to make myself taller by posing on my pedestal of thirty thousand a year. It may be a foolish whimsy, but it is a harmless one, and affords me plenty of innocent amusement. Althea smiled, but she knew it was useless to pursue the argument. Moritz and Gwendolyn were both utterly unmanageable when they had a crotchet in their head. 
They cared nothing about the world's opinion. And as for Madame Grundy, or any other madame, they had simply no regard for them. Already Viscount Ralston was considered a most eccentric person, and sundry matrons had admonished their daughters on no account to contradict him. He is a little odd, certainly, one of them remarked, but I am told he is really clever and original, and that sort of thing wears off after a time. Your father is very much taken with him, so you may make yourself as agreeable as you like to Lord Ralston. And when may I ask him to marry me? returned the daughter, to whom this Machiavellian speech had been addressed. For Lady Ginevra had plenty of spirit, and was clever enough to read between the lines. Mother was terribly put out, she informed her younger sister afterwards. She lectured me for ten minutes on what she called my coarseness and vulgarity, but as I told her, I prefer vulgarity to hypocrisy. You and father want me to marry Viscount Ralston, I told her, because he has Brentwood Hall and a fine house in town and thirty thousand a year, and it does not matter one bit if I care for him or not. If he holds out the scepter to me, I am to touch it. But thanks heavens, Jenny, these are not the dark ages, and though mother frowned and stamped her foot, there was no get thee to a nunnery. And Lady Ginevra laughed and went off to put on her habit, for it was the hour when she and her father rode in the park. Althea had a word to say before she let the subject drop. At the theatre you spoke of needing my help, Moritz. I hope you will let me know when my assistance is wanted. Oh, I was going to speak to you about that, he returned quickly. You see, my dear cousin, that there are circumstances in which a man is bound not to be selfish. Miss Mully, how his voice always softened as he said the name, is so simple and childlike. She knows so little of the world, and her life has been so retired that I dare not hurry matters. She must learn to know and trust me before I can venture to make my meaning plain. Yes, I can understand that. Gwen quite agrees with me, but all the same I think, at least I hope, that Monsieur Blackie's privation will soon be over, but Gwen and I have all our plans in readiness. What do you say to a picnic party at Brentwood about the middle of next month? My dear Moritz, are you crazy? Really, an idealist in love is a terrible being. A picnic in the middle of February. Do you want the three grim sisters, snow and hail and frost, to be amongst your guests? So, nonsense, he replied impatiently. There are lovely spring-like days in February. Besides, with the sort of picnic, I mean, weather will not signify. You had better hear my program first, Althea. Oh, go on, she returned in a resigned voice. I will try to forget my common sense while I listen to you. But he only twirled his moustache triumphantly. The party will be small and select, just you and the two Mrs. Ward and Gwen and myself. And not Noel? in some surprise. No, well, oh dear no. My friend the humorist would be decidedly de trop. He is too acute and wide awake a youth, and Monsieur Blackie will be found out in a moment. But I thought Lord Ralston was to be our host, Arthia spoke in a puzzled tone. The Mords patted her in a soothing manner. Keep calm, I entreat you, he said gently. In the presence of great thoughts, we should always keep calm. Lord Ralston is my intimate friend, please understand that. We are like brothers, he and I, and it is for the corner of his picture gallery at Brentwood that King Canute was bought. Miss Ward and her sister will be interested to see it again. And as Brentwood Hall, with its silent pool, is a show place, a picnic there will be the most natural thing in the world. And the master is absent. Yes, he is absent, but he may return at any moment and here there was a strange glow in Maud's eyes. We must leave town early, he went on briskly after a moment's pause. And I think we could reach Brentwood by midday. Gwen has promised to meet us at the hall, and we shall have plenty of time to see the picture gallery, and more of the rooms before luncheon. I shall coach the servant carefully, so there will be no contretemps. After luncheon there will be the conservatories and the silent pool, and then tea in the blue drawing room. It will be light until half past five. So you may as well tell Doreen not to expect you home until eight. Oh, I forgot one important part of the program. Gwen means to carry you off to Kingsdean, either before or after tea, to see baby Murdoch and Madame. She is staying with them at present. 
It was evident, from Althea's amused look, that the picnic at Brentwood would meet with her approval, and she was just about to give a cordial assent when Mitchell entered to tell her that luncheon was ready, and at the same time she handed her a telegram. "'It is for Miss Ward, ma'am,' she said, "'and the boy is waiting.' "'Then I suppose I had better open it,' returned Althea. "'There was some talk of their going to Cleveland Terrace to have tea with Molly, "'if they finished their shopping in time. "'Perhaps this is to say that she is out or engaged.' "'And then Althea opened the yellow envelope. "'But her countenance changed as she read the telegram. "'Do not come,' was all it said. "'Molly is ill. We'll write.' It was from Everard Ward. End of chapter 27「Chapter 28 of Molly's Prince. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Molly's Prince by Rosa Nushet Carey. Chapter 28. But yet, the pity of it. The web of our life is of a mingled yarn, good and ill together. All's well that ends well. For this relief, much thanks. Hamlet when althea had read the brief message she told mitchell very quietly that there was no answer required and that she might give the boy some refreshment and send him away and then as the maid left the room she handed the telegram to moritz it troubled her kind heart to see the pain in his eyes as he read it he was quite pale and his lips twitched under his moustache what does it mean he asked in rather a stifled voice i thought you said that she was well if she is ill why is her sister to be kept away you see what he says do not come yes i see returned althea very gravely it must be something sudden but i hope for poor dear waverley's sake that it is nothing infectious let me think for a moment one cannot grasp it at once this is wednesday and on sunday molly was well only a little pale and tired and yes i remember she had a slight headache and so waveney persuaded her not to go to church a headache and pale and tired good heavens althea it is clear as daylight she was sickening for something moritz's tone was so tragical and he paced the room so restlessly that in spite of her very real anxiety althea could hardly repress a smile dear moritz she said gently there is no need to take such a gloomy view our pretty molly is human and must be ill sometimes like other people perhaps it's a bad cold or influenza or it might even be measles they are very much about for moritz unregenerate women had been singularly captious since the new year and close muggy days had paved the way for all kinds of ailments to which flesh is heir there was a great deal of sickness at Deerham and althea had been both wise and careful in refusing to allow waveney to go as usual amongst her pensioners of course it may be anything returned lord ralston impatiently for even his easy temper was not proof against the bitterness of his disappointment he had so hungered and thirsted poor fellow for a sight of molly's sweet face all these weeks he had been doing his duty nobly and now he had looked for his reward absence makes a heart grow fonder he had said to himself that very morning would this bud of love 
which he had been nurturing so tenderly have blossomed into a beauteous flower when they met again over and over again he had asked himself this question but molly was ill and all hope of an immediate answer was over it may be anything he repeated but who is to look after her there is only her father and that half-witted maid of all work there used to be some friend who nursed them when they were ill but she is living somewhere in the country with an invalid lady we must get a nurse do you know where their doctor lives but althea shook her head no but we can find out moritz i think the best plan will be for me to go over to cleveland terrace and then i can tell waveney exactly how things are i will leave a line for doreen and beg her to say nothing until my return then a look of intense relief crossed moritz's face it's a good idea he said eagerly and i will go with you and althea made no objection to this it is a pity the carriage is out she said regretfully but george shall get us a cab now we will go and have some luncheon and then i will get ready but with both of them the meal was a pretense apprehension and worry deprived moritz of all appetite and althea was so nervous and fluttered at the idea of encountering everard in his own home that she could scarcely eat a morsel she rose as soon as possible and left moritz to finish his repast but he preferred pacing the room in spite of his vivacity and gaiety de cour his jaunty airs and cheerfulness he was easily depressed any form of illness that attacked those he loved preyed on his mind when gwendolen's little son was born he was so anxious and despondent that jack compton in spite of his own natural solicitude for his young wife's safety laughed at him and told him that he looked as melancholy as a gib cat the old chap was in the doldrums and no mistake he said to gwen afterwards i tell him i played the man twice as well as he but he is a good old sort too and then with awe and wonder the young father regarded the small and crumpled and exceedingly red morsel of humanity lying snugly within gwen's arm as they drove up to cleveland terrace they saw an unmistakable doctor's bohem before the door of number ten lord ralston's swarthy complexion turned rather livid at the sight but althea only remarked with composure that they had come just at the right time noel opened the door to them he had seen them from the window his face brightened perceptibly father has gone up with dr duncan he said but they will be coming down directly you had better come up into the studio there is a fire there and noel led the way althea glanced quickly around the room as she entered it was shabby there could be no doubt of that but there was an air of comfort about it and then she subsided wearily into a corner of the big cosy-looking couch but moritz marched off to the inner room and stood with his back to them gazing at poor molly's little writing-table with an aching heart noel what is the matter with your sister asked althea in a low voice but noel could not tell her she had seemed queer and feverish the previous day he explained and his father had advised her remaining in bed she had a bad night and her throat was painful and he had been forbidden to go near her this was dr duncan's first visit they had sent for him in the morning but he had been unable to come until now 
it was evident that noel could not enlighten them much so althea forbore to question him further and waited silently until they heard footsteps descending the stairs but as they passed by the studio door althea heard the doctor say i will look in later and see what you have done about the nurse noel heard it too for he looked rather startled a nurse he muttered poor old pater that will bother him a bit and then everard came quickly into the room noel i want you he said rather sharply duncan says but here he stopped in sudden surprise as althea's tall figure rose from the couch mr ward she said quietly waveney was out so i opened your telegram and i have come to see if there's anything i can do for molly my cousin lord i mean mr ingram has brought me then everard with rather a sad smile held out his hand to the young man you are both very kind he said simply but there is nothing you can do for the dear child molly is very ill and dr duncan wishes her to have a good nurse at once i'm going to send noel off to the institution he has given me the address it is diphtheria and her throat is in a dreadful state and there is no time to be lost let me go returned moritz earnestly i will take a hansom and be there in no time mr ward i shall esteem it as a favor and a mark of true friendship if you will send me instead of noel but before everard could reply to this urgent request althea's gentle voice interposed mr ward please listen to me a moment i know what this illness means i have had it myself molly will need two nurses there will be no one to take care of her by day while the nurse rests and any neglect will be an awful risk please let moritz go and settle the business there need only be one to-night but the day nurse must relieve her to-morrow morning let him have the address and noel can go with him and then you must let me go up and see molly and then everard in a dazed fashion held out a folded piece of paper two nurses i shall be in the workhouse they heard him mutter but no one took any notice althea you are a trump whispered moritz as she followed him into the passage tell me anything she needs and i will get it two nurses she'll have a dozen nurses if the doctor approves we will have a second opinion we will have the great throat doctor sir hindley richmond down but what more moritz would have said in that eager sibilant whisper was never known for althea gave him an impatient little push go go there is no use in talking i shall not leave until the nurse arrives and then she went back into the studio she had forgotten her nervousness now her reluctance to enter everard's house her face glowed with kindly womanly sympathy as she approached him i am so sorry for you she said gently and i am sorry for dear molly too for it is such a painful complaint but with good nursing i hope she will soon be well is dr duncan a clever man oh yes i believe so returned mr ward dejectedly but his charges are very high miss hartford i am afraid we must manage with one nurse i have not the means i am a poor man but althea turned a deaf ear to this it was far too early in the day to proffer help he must not be told yet that he has good friends who were only too thankful to be allowed to bear his burdens for molly's sake for waveney's sake and for poor moritz's sake 
there must be no indulgence of false and misplaced pride he must be managed adroitly and with finesse and female diplomacy no masculine blundering must affect this how did molly catch it she asked to turn his thoughts from the question of expense but everett could not answer this question molly had not seemed well since sunday he said she had been restless and irritable and complained of feeling ill she had been so feverish in the night that he thought it must be influenza and he had sent for dr duncan but early as it was he had already started on his rounds and had only just come he would pay another visit later in the evening althea listened to this in silence then she said rather gravely mr ward what are we to do about waveney it will break her heart to be kept from molly and yet then he turned upon her almost fiercely and there was an excited gleam in his eye i will not have it tell waveney that i forbid her to come near the house good heavens would she add to my troubles it is not enough to have one child ill then his eyes filled with tears and the hand he put on althea's arm shook a little dear miss hartford be my friend in this keep waveney safe for me and something in his tone told Athea that, dearly as Everett loved all his children, this was the one who came closest to his heart. Do not fear, she returned tenderly. You can trust me, and Waveney loves you far too well to disobey you. But, here she sighed, it will certainly break her heart. Molly is her other and her dearer self yes poor darling i know that but she must be brave tell her from me please that i will write twice a day if that will comfort her she shall know everything there shall be nothing hidden from her yes i will tell her returned althea sorrowfully and when my cousin returns we will arrange about noel he must not stop here then there was an unmistakable look of gratitude in everard's eyes you think of everything he said in a broken voice i was troubling sadly about the poor lad now i am afraid i must leave you as molly has no other nurse but he was both touched and surprised when althea rose too let me go with you she said quickly i am not the least afraid i had the complaint very badly myself before we left kitlands i fear we are both doing wrong returned everard hesitating your sister will be very angry with you but althea shook her head very decidedly at this and he was too bewildered and miserable to argue the point the sick-room looked bare and comfortless to althea's eyes in spite of the bright fire burning cheerily in the grate the big iron bedstead with its old and obviously patched quilt the dark stained wood furniture and the narrow window seats with faded red cushions were hardly a fit shrine for molly's dainty beauty molly lay uncomfortably on her pillows she looked flushed and ill and her beautiful eyes had a heavy distressed look in them she held out her hands rather eagerly to althea but the next moment she drew them back oh i forgot she said in a thick voice and it was evidently a great effort to speak you must not come near me dr duncan said so tell my darling wave that she must keep away if she loves me and ask her not to fret oh i cannot talk and here poor molly flung herself back on the pillows and her hot restless fingers 
tried to put back the heavy masses of rough tangled hair how althea longed to brush it out and sponge the fevered face and hands but at her first hint everard frowned and looked anxious not for worlds he said decidedly the nurse will be here directly the institution is hardly a mile from here and ingram will take a hansom he spoke in a low voice but molly heard him oh father is mr ingram here she whispered how sorry he will be to hear i am ill and then a sudden thought struck her and she beckoned to althea rather excitedly miss hartford she said in her poor hoarse voice will you do something for me in that small right-hand drawer behind you you will see a little parcel it is directed please give it to mr ingram from me althea secretly marvelled at this but held her peace when the dainty white parcel was in her hand she said gently yes dear molly he shall have it directly he returns but now your father does not wish me to stay good-bye god bless you my child and althea's tone of faltering tenderness arrested everard's attention it would not be safe i dare not let you do anything for her he said very softly as he opened the door i will stay with her until the nurse comes but please go down and rest and althea who was trembling with some strange emotion obeyed him without a word end of chapter twenty eight recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c